Good afternoon. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to another edition of Purple Points. I'm joined today by a wonderful guest, uh, Associate Professor Michael Gillespie. He's Associate Professor of Cinema Studies, and he's joining us today, and I'm excited to have him. He is the author of the forthcoming work, Film Blackness, American Cinema and the Idea of Black Film on Duke University Press. It is due out early 2016. So, uh, Michael, welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So the initial question I typically start with is, what comes to mind when you think of the color purple? Uh, what comes to mind? Uh, well, I suppose I have to think about the first time I saw the film. Um, I was, what, a sophomore or junior in high school in uh, Marietta, Georgia. And I remember making and making it a point that I was going to take my mother out to go see <laughs> the color purple. So uh, I remember that we dressed up. Kind of, she kind of dressed up. I kind of dressed up, and uh, we went to go see the color purple. And it was just. Uh, I remember going into the theater, and it seemed like everyone that I had that uh, I had known from. Uh, Various Jack and Jill functions was there too, <laughs> and so, but I had no idea what the story was about. Um, you know, I, I I think I vaguely knew it was an adaptation, um, and then I saw the film and I was kind of blown away just because I'd never really been exposed to that kind of content before, or that kind of really a, a story focalized around this notion of a black woman's perspective. Um, mm -hmm. or a black woman's narrative. Um, and then I think uh, a lot of my memories just get clouded by a lot of the rhetoric surrounding the film of this idea that it was uh, a film that hated black men. And, and then, um, so when I, I think of this period in the 80s that for me I kind of mark of, 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 of deliberately kind of responding of um, walking out of A Color Purple as a, a, a young black man and feeling as though I, I you know, I can handle it. <laughs> I can, mm -hmm. I can okay. handle this story being told. I don't feel as though I'm being crucified or indicted. But um, I was thinking about it this morning, though, of... So you've got the color purple that comes out in 85 and there's that huge groundswell of reaction against it, which is already accumulated from the release of the book in 82, right? right? So after 85, it seems to me that there are these really interesting public discussions of invalidating black women's stories that, that begin to happen. So you have Tawana Brawley in 1987. Um, right. You've got Scheherazade Ali's Black Woman, Black Man's Guide to the Black Woman, which comes right. out in '89. You've got um, uh, the the Clarence Thomas and Nita Hill hearings in 1990. You've got Marion Barry being busted, and I remember being at Morehouse. Um, so there's that moment in the videotape when he finds out that his mistress set him up, and he says, "I can't believe that bitch set me up." And I remember the next day around the AUC that people had t-shirts that were made up that said, I saw the videotape and the bitch set him up. Um, and then in 1991, we have the Mike Tyson rape trial, right? So, so for me, it's this, the color purple, the film and its release is just a part of this really strange historical chain. Well, it's not really that strange of this general invalidation of, of black women's stories and this, 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 this sense that black women are, 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 are not to be trusted uh, or that they are incapable of truth. And that, for, and, and that significantly starts for me with the release of, of, of A Color Purple in 85. I, there's plenty of things that happened before it, but just mm -hmm. the way that there was this gathering of, of knives around A Color Purple uh, that became bigger than the legitimacy of, of, of can a Jewish director tell a black woman's story or is this a story that should be told? Um, but it seems to me there was just so little discussion of, uh, of the film as ever being legitimate and for so many Absolutely. reasons. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, so this, that was kind of the, the rush of things that came to mind of, of thinking, of the, immediately thinking about Color Purple. 
Yeah, you raised some some interesting points there, and I was thinking about the who can forget the Bell Biv DeVoe classic. Uh, you know, never never trust a big button to smile. Yeah, yeah, never, so yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. whole running narrative throughout popular culture um, against uh, black women in, in some respects. Uh, so one of the things that you you sort of hint at in your commentary is the pushback to the color purple, uh, the writing, the directing, and what what's yeah. happening in Hollywood. So for a lot of uh, conversations, I've talked quite a bit about the content, the characters. And so what I'm interested in is if you could talk about some of the production cycles uh, that happened in Hollywood, particularly in the 80s, where we're seeing some really interesting moments. If we take right. Donald Bogle, uh, the film scholar's uh, term, uh, he looks at the 80s as the era of the tan, where you're starting to see greater visibility of black people in Hollywood, but there are these oh. very uh, narrow streams of representation. Uh, and of course, uh, Guerrero talks yeah. a little bit about the, the strategies of containment. Um, right. so how do you think the color purple functions within these various moments in Hollywood and how it's still able to, if you think so, speak to some validity of the experience that black women are having, particularly as it relates to um, this period in the South? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that, you know, that one of the, th you know, particularly thinking about, as you've mentioned, Bogle's work and, and Ed's framing blackness, that, um, you know, there, there's this conversation that's happening about sort of the rise of Richard Pryor in the 1970s, quickly becoming one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood. And then in the 80s, you see Eddie Murphy on that rise as well. Um, of, of becoming the biggest star in, in Hollywood at that point. But that the kinds of films that are being made are still very much in this, the, there's, there's this uh, prevalence of kind of the, the, still the buddy film, um, a great deal of kind of the, the, the comedy dramas. Um, but what in retrospect, thinking about A Color Purple, it's just, it's a very ambitious film to me in terms of the people that are involved, particularly in terms of this of uh, Quincy Jones working with with Steven Spielberg, and this attempt to kind of tell what is a rather epic film uh, uh, that at that point in Spielberg's career, I don't think he had done anything as ambitious in terms of having an historical sweep like this. Um, so I'm also kind of thinking about how. Uh, you know, there are people that kind of negatively frame The Wiz as the film that kind of killed any Hollywood ambitions of a great black cinema moment that would come out of black exploitation. Um, and I, I don't think that's particularly fair, but I, I do feel as though what's happening with uh, the, the kind of players that are being brought together as a team to work on The Color Purple it's it's quite ambitious, and I think it's quite significant that there are so many folks like that from from various industries were were attempting to work together on this. Um, I also think that it's interesting that Alice Walker initially was not particularly vocal about some of the adaptation changes that were made, and it was only until years later, I think, and if I'm if I'm correct on that, about one of her fairly recent memoirs where she began, or maybe maybe in the last 10, 15 years, where she admits that yes, she was uncomfortable with some of those choices that were being made. Um, but I still feel, you know, even when we kind of think of the rise of various characters, I mean, it's Adolf Caesar's last film, mm -hmm. uh, who at that point, I mean, he'd already been so well established on, on, on the stage, but on screen, I mean, it seems to me that we really only have a soldier story, and then we have a color purple, and he died during the color uh, during the production of Color Purple. You've got Danny Glover, who's amazing, um, who before that, uh, I think he had he had only had like a film debut only a few years before. Um, you've got Oprah Winfrey, of course, and that and that kind of constantly recycled story that she wasn't really told that she was going to be called nigger by the extras when they were attacking her in the street, so that her reaction was a bit more uncontrolled than she had thought. But still, and then of course the story of her trying to squeeze into her Oscar dress, dress which I always find hysterical. 
Uh, and then Whoopi Goldberg as well, someone who's kind of transitioning from the Broadway stage. So regardless of how people might look back at this film disparagingly, um, I think a lot of careers were generated out of it. Uh, and, and of course, I'm sorry, Quincy Jones, of course, this is a particularly big feather in his cap ever after already having a, a long established um, soundtrack career or, or, or yeah, a career uh, uh, marked by some really influential soundtracks. And, you know, I remember my parents going out and even buying that Color Purple soundtrack album, the, the, the purple vinyl, oh, yeah. <laughs> the purple vinyl. And then actually finding, you know, when you're reading through the history of those songs that there was a lot of, of, of kind of musicologic knowledge that went into, uh, not necessarily that this film was going to be um, about a reflection of truth, but that it was actually doing a kind of archive labor that I think is, is mm -hmm. quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. So all of these things to me strikes me as, you know, particularly for 1985, as a, a pretty important moment in terms of the the kind of uh, the capacity of Hollywood to generate uh, distinctive and alternative in, in terms of the, what was generally circulating at that time, but kind of alternative uh, renderings of blackness on film. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm just thinking about you know it's it's somewhat of a uh, you forgive the sports analogy, but you got the uh, you know, dream team here with yeah. some Hall of Fame type players and some up and coming players. Right. Who, right. Looking back on it, it it's, a, it's a pretty powerful moment. And you kind of see this um, cycle return with, um, it was a made for Showtime film, if my memory serves, with Whoopi Goldberg and Danny Glover uh, serving as uh, the two lead characters in another uh, novel turned film, uh, Good Fences. So it's yes, kind of yeah, yeah. interesting to see that, that narr narrative arc in terms of time period and then just where they are in their careers at the moment that they team up again. Um, so, you know, the other thing I'm thinking of as you're, you're talking about the construction of um, the production unit is, you know, we often hear about some of the challenges that uh, black folks have in Hollywood, getting the film made from page to screen. Uh, so what do you think are some of the, the challenges that um, and these are even contemporary conversations yeah. as well. Um, a black filmmaker would have in terms of getting a story like this told. And there are some who would argue that in terms of content, depth of content, that we're actually going backward in terms of black yeah. cinema, if, if you uh, like that term, black cinema. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the, the, the first thing that comes to mind in, in terms of, of, of our current moment and, and, and the moment of that the film comes out in 85 is, is uh, I, I, I suppose I want to speak a little bit to this issue of um, the critique of the film as, as, as that it's not appropriate for a Jewish director to do this film, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, and, and the preciseness of that, of claiming that a Jewish man cannot tell a black woman's story or, uh, or, or a black story more generally, which um, I think a film, A Soldier Story, kind of disputes that belief. But also to kind of keep in mind that, you know, Jim Brown has talked about this, that in the production company that he set up with Richard Pryor, that they had a script for, for The Color Purple on the desk with them. And Jim Brown could not get Richard Pryor to commit. I mean, nothing came out of this production company that Richard Pryor had put together, but that there was an opportunity then to say, do a, a black version of, 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 of this that never really came to fruition. Um, I, so in terms of thinking about, you know, the, as you put it, this kind of dream train gathering, I think that we are living as, as scholars who are interested in blackness and cinema and, as, and as, 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 as members of the audience who like to go see uh, blackness on the screen with some measure of nuance, I actually think we're living at, in a pretty exciting time now. Um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, thinking of we could say 2008 or 2009 since then, the, the proliferation of independent black cinema 
at these kind of um, historically important independent film venues, particularly Telluride and Sundance or at South by Southwest. Um, mm -hmm. uh, on, the, on the Hollywood level, things might not be particularly thriving, but on an independent level, um, I think things are pretty, in, uh, pretty imp uh, 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 incredible right now. Um, I don't think, and, and I don't think that the, the current Hollywood model, uh, black, white, yellow, brown, yellow, red, whatever, is is particularly interested in any kind of complicated cinema. Um, you know, I'm thinking recently of Steven Soderbergh's comments about a year and a half ago, where he just basically threw his hands up and says, you know, I cannot work in this in this this current version of Hollywood. David Lynch has said the same thing, you know. So a lot of cats that uh, that quickly became established as American auteurs in the last 30, 40 years, um, the current Hollywood model doesn't sustain it. Um, it it's it's there's there's not enough investment in 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 telling really complicated stories that will because these complicated stories stories that don't leave you that don't leave you feeling as though you've been condescended to with a whole lot of mm -hmm. Hallmark crap, you know, a la crash mm -hmm. or something like that. <laughs> you know, That's it's like, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big kid. You can, you can scare me with some shit. You can, you, and it's okay for me to leave the movie theater and be haunted by a film. I'm, I'm down mm -hmm. for that. Uh, but I don't like, you know, I, I don't like this unicorn talk or things with a pretty little bow on it. And and that's 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 antithetical towards big money, uh, towards Absolutely. big production. So yeah, especially uh, when you think of the the kind of dollars that are being generated um, in the the summer blockbuster cycle that we're currently in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, dope is out, and I'm really happy to see that out. And there's a lot of you know, they're definitely going to make a lot of money on the soundtrack, which is which is good because I know that that was something that helped Spike Lee over his first three films particularly that he could always say that, you know, that you're going to make money in the soundtrack. So particularly school days and, and do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, it's, I, 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 th I, there are just so many, there, there's so many black folk that are doing interesting work. It's just work that you have to dig a little bit more to see, or it's not going to have a, uh, um, it's not going to be in your local theaters very long. There's, it, it's whatever remains of the art house cinema circuit, the, they're getting this work, you know? So, uh, uh, and I think that's, that's pretty important. Absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, something you're, you're saying, just thinking about the Hollywood cycle and this, this stage it sets for the idea of blackness and black film. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of how does that, in some ways, uh, set the expectations of, of the audience member who, let's say they go to a uh, Tyler Perry film, hopefully get their money back, um, and then <laughs> they watch uh, something else that's a little bit more complicated in terms of this narrative structure. How do you think this plays with their idea and their expectation of what, you know, blackness is and the idea of it, particularly as it relates to uh, the art of cinema and storytelling? Right. Um... So one, one of the lines that I have in my book is that uh, if I want to see myself, I'll go look in a mirror. I won't look at a screen. And, uh, and I still, I feel that because I don't want to be, I don't want to be too cheeky and cute about it or, or to condescend to folks who are inspired by black film. I, uh, I, I think that's, I mean, that's kind of an intangible value to whatever, however we want to quantify black film, that folks can go, they see something, and inspires them or to, to do whatever, you know. And you can't really measure that or, uh, at all. Um, but what I do think is that there has to be a way that we can actually, that we can deal with, like, say, the fundamental contradiction of black film, right? So okay. here's, the fun, here's the fundamental contradiction of black film uh, opposed, uh, in, in terms of respectability politics, and those folks are still trapped in kind of a positive-negative debate in the 80s. They will say that we need, uh, we need to see reflections of the world in which we live in. We need to see positive reflections of the world that we live in. 
and as a result, that there, there, there will be some way that that will touch us and impact the way we live our lives, okay? Now, for me, if I wanted, if, if the type of cinema that would reflect the, the, the kind of social life of race in America today cannot be measured in positive and negative terms. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 it is, it's messy, and it's disturbing, and it, it can be inspiring. And it, it can be beautiful and it can be ugly. It can be so many things. So that's the kind of stuff I want to see on the screen if I was invested in the reflectionist argument. But really what the reflectionist argument says is that I want something that's completely unrealistic. <laughs> I want something that in no way addresses the world that I live in. Now, I'm not saying that it has to address the world that we live in. But if those are the terms that they're arguing, then it's a contradiction that they're putting forth, you know, because they don't really want to see the way that the world is on the screen. They just want to see some shiny, happy, black, colored people, uh, uh, respectability politics kind of dreamscape kind of stuff. And that is, you know, why do we even have to? I mean, I understand the power of film. I'm not disavowing that. And I know that. We could go as far back as looking at Woodrow Wilson chilling in the White House and watching The Birth of a Nation and being like, you know, this is lightning in the bottle and how that film led to the formation of the Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux Klan membership rising everywhere over a damn film. Or the fear of Jack Johnson and states having to ban boxing films everywhere. I understand that films can have a material effect, but I don't think, I just don't believe that because these films can, can, there's the possibility of there being a material effect, I still don't think it's appropriate to kind of hold these films to this unrealistic standard. Mm -hmm. So is your argument more complexity and nuanced storytelling rather than, um, as a general example, like a Spencer Williams or Oscar Michaud film from uh, the talkie era? Um, something that, because if we look at some of those films, right, the, the race films, yeah, a lot of them have the positive stories. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, so, are you asking for more nuanced stories that may or may not be positive and negative if they even work in that framing, but just something that tries to deal with the complexities of life, the gray area, the the messy yeah, the, politics of, of of living. Yeah, it can deal with the messy politics of 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 ideas about black life. It can also be about addressing how black film is an art and therefore is speaking to particular traditions. I think the anecdote that I kind of always use to qualify it, it what, what I'm trying to do, or, or at least helped me understand what the hell I was trying to do, is when, um, is when Spike Lee's Clockers came out, right? So Clockers comes out. Harry Allen at the Village Voice decides that he's going to put together a special roundtable discussion to address that film. So the special roundtable is a New York City police officer, a drug dealer, and a emergency medical technician. The, the, uh, the drug dealer, whose name was Ace, said that Clockers was a bad film because we don't use that term, Clockers. The, the New York City police officer said that Clockers was a bad film because it makes New York City police officers look racist. Uh, and then I had, and then he kind of nitpicked about the shape of the procedural room. And the emergency medical technician just bizarrely was, uh, he said the gunshots didn't look real in that kind of opening montage of, of, okay. of clock. So uh, what really struck me about all that, other than you know having this what the hell are you talking about moment is that None of them were willing to measure it as a film. None of them were willing to measure it as a piece of art. So there's, there, there's, no, there's no investment in, say, asking, well, what, does Clockers, what is Clocker's place in the tradition of film noir? What is Clocker's place, say, in the tradition of thinking about the urban space and issues of criminality in literature, particularly in terms of the work of Chester Hines? None of that really comes to mind because it's more immediately about this indexical tie to reality. And I suppose for me, what I'm trying to do in my work is uh, suspend that impulse to, make, to tie everything to the lived experience 
and actually think about, so what is, what is a film like uh, Wendell Harris's Chameleon Street speak to? And for me, that yeah. speaks to a larger tradition of, of passing narratives. And what does like Bill Duke's deep cover? For me, that's, that's like one of the best expressions of, of film noir that I've ever seen. And I kind of argue, and also the way that it, it, it undercuts the buddy film formula. With, in terms of the relationship between Lawrence Fishburne and, and Jeff Goldblum. Or in, in my last chapter of Medicine for Melancholy, I kind of talk about it in terms of there's this braiding sense of, of romance, uh, of the space itself of San Francisco and the potentialities of black love. And why does black love okay. matter in this moment of an age of gentrification? So I'm interested in what black film does, not what it, and with, with as little preconceived impressions uh, of what that must be. I, I'm, I'm always looking for ways that a film can be contextualized in, in the larger tradition of black visual and expressive culture. Uh, but it doesn't have to be me. And it, mm -hmm. it, doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be the people around me. It can just be whatever the hell it wants to be. And it's my job as a scholar invested in the idea of black film is to understand it as a really important American tradition, an important American cinematic tradition. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of why I call it film blackness. Yeah, I, I like that, and I think that's an important conversation to have. And then I'm wondering at the same time if, in order to have that conversation, do we have the the vocabulary, the images to sort of sustain that dialogue? If we're so mired in the good, bad, positive, negative sort of, yeah. sort of space, which I think in some ways is a function of, just in terms of Hollywood, not necessarily independent cinema, um, this idea of scarcity. So you have yeah. one or two major black films and, and they have to be all things for all people. And they're already um, in a space of underachieving because it's, it's not possible. Um, right. And then in terms of the Hollywood system, if you have say a film like um, Ava DuVernay's film released, and then you have in that same month weekend a Tyler Perry film release, and you're looking at the box office receipts, there's one that says, oh, we need to make more of these. And so right. you get into this repetitive loop about the value of black cinema and which one uh, should be made. Obviously, if you're you know counting beans, it's going to be the one that generates the most revenue. So right. it's one of those spaces where I'm wondering if we feel somewhat like uh, Jarima, where he's just basically Hollywood's plantation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to see some freedom stories, well, get off I think the plantation. You're a different level. You can have, you can be like Gold Star Plantation member, right? You, know, you can so, you can get a better view than most on that plantation. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's can we expect a, uh, a, an industry which demonstrates the core values of capitalism to have any kind of social responsibility. I don't think so. Uh, because Hollywood's definition of social responsibility is that uh, whatever problems there are in society, they are not systemic. They are just isolated incidents that they can, they can kind of raise the issue of the problem, but in Traditionally around in, in 120 minutes, they'll squash that shit. Everything will be resolved. People will be back in their proper place. Um, I don't really, I, I mean, Ava, you know, I, I was recently rewatching Middle of Nowhere. I think uh, DuVernay De, is an amazing filmmaker. And I think that that's probably my favorite film by her. I was thinking about some of the issues I had with Selma, which really wasn't an issue of her, but just thinking about civil rights history and that, and, and, and that rendering of civil rights history. But mm -hmm. I'm also kind of really tripping out on the fact that she's going to be doing Black Panther. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, to, yeah. think of, to, to, to think about from I Will Follow to Middle of Nowhere to Selma to now Black Panther, I mean, that's a really incredibly escalating arc, right? right Where, right. you know, someone who's traditionally, who, is, who has been a strong supporter of these kind of ind black film independent distribution channels has been able to seemingly on some very particular terms 
of her own finally uh, uh, find herself firmly ensconced within the you know what is an incredible um, Hollywood franchise, which is the Marvel Comics spinoffs. Um, that's 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 quite an exceptional moment, and and it's it's so rare at this point that uh, uh, I think you know maybe one could have could make an argument for us being able to, that maybe we should appreciate uh, what Lee Daniels has been able to accomplish as well. Um, I still think that brother has to learn what a narrative is, but other, <laughs> <laughs> at the very least. But uh, and I might have problems with his with his, the formal issues with his work. I don't want to talk mm -hmm. to the content because it seemed to me that uh, you know the, again in terms of thinking of the color purple. When I saw again the way that that uh, black male public intellectuals responded to Precious, I felt as though it, they were saying the exact same thing that uh, about the color purple in 1985. Mm -hmm. And the same, and which was the exact same thing they said about Michelle Wallace's uh, the myth of oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, black super again of, of of leaving you in this place to to kind of raise color purple again. I mean, when is it ever appropriate for a black woman to tell a story in the terms that this kind of black male intelligentsia will accept? Uh, mm -hmm. And it seems to me it's never <laughs> right. Right. It's never appropriate, uh, but the way that this rhetoric is kind of coached in that that we're being hard on this sister, but we're being hard on this sister because uh, we we love the race so much, and it's mm -hmm. bullshit. But it's 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 yeah. bullshit, it's it's bullshit, which is still kind of pervasive. So uh, yeah, so I guess in some ways I have to support Lee Daniels for what he does, but I. Please, brother man, learn what a narrative is. Just the basic stuff. Not saying you have to sit down and read Bordwell and Thompson or anything, but <laughs> just beginning, middle, end. Just that's all. Yeah, I, I think I'm with you, and you know, I think there's this old notion of uh, I, w I don't want to blame it on the '60s, but it seems very pronounced that this idea of black masculinity, yeah, which yeah, you know obviously involves a, a key moment of patriarchy. Is, right. you know, that's how things are. And it's about the race, although right. it's not. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as I've had these conversations about the color purple, I think despite its its flaws and, and whatever else we may find uh, issue with, uh, it's a powerful narrative. Uh, right. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of um, themes in there, you know, in terms of self-discovery, a uh, relationship with yourself, loving yourself, uh, right. finding out who you are and you know i would even argue there's even some pushback against um uh, patriarchal christianity right uh, they may not term it as such in the film but there's certainly this the spirituality evolving spirituality among the uh female characters in the narrative uh, which i think having seen the film and the play and read the book um you can really see those outside of the book you can really see uh that that relationship grow throughout the uh, the play in particular. But I think the film, uh, particularly with the moments you highlight in 85 and thereafter, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a powerful sort of moment in uh, black cultural production. And one that I think even by, you know, today's standards, if we look at the film, it's, it's production value, it's cast, um, there, there's some pretty uh, impactful things happening in there. And so one of the, the final things that, that I kind of wanted to ask, and I think it's becoming this, this closing question. Yeah. Is, um, if that film were remade, um, if you think it should be remade, how do you think the story um, would speak to, you know, the contemporary politi political moment in terms of Black Lives Matter? And we're seeing sort of the, the face of, of racism uh, rear its head in really, really interesting ways in the 21st century. Uh, I won't say new because it's not necessarily new. Right. Um, but how do you think this story um, would try to speak to that? If you think it would, or if it would just kind of speak to that particular time in the past. Hmm. Well, uh, 
by way of answer, I mean, the, the, while you were talking, the first thing that came to mind that I guess uh, I, I, I do want to say, and that's kind of helping me answer your question, is that if it wasn't for this film, I wouldn't have read the book. Mm. I, I was inspired to read The Color Purple uh, after I saw the film in 1985. And I don't know if I, you know, it wasn't sitting, the book wasn't sitting in my family nightstand or anything like that. Um, so... One of the things that I suppose in terms of remaking it that would actually, I, I think, kind of speak to this issue of thinking about the value of black life, I would have, I would hope, well, first of all, I would hope they would never remake it. <laughs> but if they were to remake it, that there would be a more sustained attention to um, her post-Mr. Life. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, I mean, there are, for me, the, the parts, there, there are some moments in the end when she has her whole Taylor business set up and when Mr. finally comes back around and they, they start, they're, they're actually socializing together and Mr. actually asks her to marry her again. There's that line that I always remember where she just looks at Mr. and she's like, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, I don't like frogs. And that always, <laughs> it, it always kind of lays me out. I, it, I find it's a great line, but it also, if it, that there's something about her, the, the way in which uh, her life thrives and in terms of not only with her business, but also the, the, the way in which she um, actually ends up having a family. A family before she, before that family from Africa ends up returning, that uh, that to me would be an uh, an important thing to kind of speak to the the possibilities of Black Life Matters of 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 being able to set up structures uh, of support and of love and and uh, and and foundational beliefs in one another that. Uh, I think that that last section of the color purple, which really didn't make it to the screen, would would really kind of bear out a bit more, um, because there's ways in which the the way that Jim Crow does rear its head within the text, um, uh, that I think it does that that strangely in the film I think you get what you know what uh, Aisha Hardison talks about in terms of Jane Crow experience. Uh, uh, I think you get that in the original film, um, but in terms of, uh, as I said, this this um, this base of, of of solidarity, you don't get enough of that from in, in terms of her post Mister life. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'd definitely like to thank you for being a part of uh, Purple Points today. And thank uh, you for uh, inviting me. I hope I didn't prattle too much. <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely not. It was, it was great. It was wonderful. And for those of you who may be listening or watching, I hope you will continue and be on the lookout for uh, the good doctor's book, Film Blackness, American Cinema and the Idea of Black Film, uh, coming out on Duke University Press in early 2016. And thanks for watching Purple Points. All right.